Welcome back. Silver and Black today, the Thursday edition. Raider Nation, we hope you're doing well out there. And thank you for joining us for another show. Whether you're listening to us on audio or watching us on video, we do very, very much appreciate you guys being here. Without you guys, we're not here. So thank you for that. And I say we, it's myself, Scalkel Branson, along with my partner, Mo Moten, senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report, also the Raiders columnist up on uh, sportsnot.com where you can catch his Raiders only. He does Raider stuff on Bleacher Report too. Of course, he does his Bleacher Report lives, which you probably watched yesterday on Wednesday. And Mo lost his temper and started yelling. No, I'm just kidding. He did not. Uh, but if you don't already do that, make sure you go check him out. Also follow him on x.com at Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at L-V Gully, G-U-L-L-Y, and the show is SNB. Today, also make sure you subscribe to the show. If you don't already subscribe to the show, even if you're watching us on video, do us a big favor. It really helps us out. If you go and subscribe to the audio version, turn on the auto download and you can get it wherever you get your audio. We are everywhere. We're ubiquitous. No matter what your channel, no matter what your device, you can find silver and black today. All right, Mo, we're getting ready. Uh, we have this, this kind of dead week in between now and the Super Bowl. So the NFL world is a little strange. We're, we're as we record here on Wednesday, we don't have an answer yet on the Raiders' offensive coordinator. Which some, yeah, you might start to think, well, maybe that's the Clint Kubiak rumor we heard. The Raiders being interested in him. You kind of got to give some credence to it now, at least on face value, because he's the only one still uh, that's still playing because the 49ers are in the Super Bowl. So uh, interested to hear your thoughts there. Cliff Kingsbury, I did a story up him, uh, on him on Sports Not. We've heard some other names, of course. Getze, Luke Getze from the Bears, who was fired after the, uh, this season. Um, quickly, before we get into the whole quarterback discussion, give me your, your perspective on the offensive corner. It's obviously a huge, huge hire for for Antonio Pierce and for the Raider organization. Give me give me your thoughts so far on where it is and where you think it's going. I mean, the Raiders wouldn't be interested in Matt Nagy on the other <laughs> side of the coin for the, for the Chiefs. So, uh-oh, no. uh-oh. No, I'm kidding. But you're, you're absolutely right. With the whole Clint Kubiak talk, you, you wonder if the Raiders are just waiting for him to be available before they lock, before they lock him in or, you know, at least, you know, Bring him in to say, okay, he he's our top front, he's our front runner for the office corner position. But I will say that who knows? Maybe they settle with not settle, but maybe they maybe they hire Cliff Kingsbury, who was the guy that I brought up a while ago via Colin Cowherd through his sources. Maybe Alex Van Pelt. Alex Van Pelt, remember, I don't know, a lot of people would say Alex Van Pelt didn't call plays. He did call plays for one playoff game against the Steelers when Baker Mayfield was there. I actually wouldn't mind Alex Van Pelt, but I think Clint Kubiak is is the number one guy that Raider Nation is talking about right now simply because he he's in San Francisco. When you're under Cal Shanahan and you get that shine, you're going to get a lot of buzz. It's similar <laughs> to Sean McVay and Los Angeles. So I understand why Raider fans would want Clint Kubiak, but I will say that I wouldn't be bummed if the, if the decision came down to Alex Van Pelt or Cliff Kingsbury. Yeah, I, I think I think the three of them are interesting, and I think each one of them, like any candidate, and this is where I always – we got into it the other day, and of course we'll talk about quarterbacks throughout this show because that's the focus today. But it's amazing to me because no candidate, or I should say very, very, very few candidates or players – have so much upside that you don't even consider their downsides, right? So, so you look at the offensive coordinator role, you look at the three candidates that we we know kind of are in the mix now, and fourth, if you consider Getsy, and they all have positives and negatives. I mean, you talk about Clint Kubiak, not a lot of experience calling plays, right? Um, and and so you can look at that. Yes, he's on a team that's in the Super Bowl, so that gives him definitely a different kind of shine. And around the league, his reputation has has started to grow. So he's one of those up and coming guys. And that's cool. That's good, too. But then you look at Van Pelt. He's already done the job with some good results, even though uh, he found himself outside looking in 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 Cleveland. So that's the downside for him. And then, of course, Kingsbury uh, did well in college as an offensive coordinator, the air raid offense. I've been going back and forth with people on air raid offense because I won't work in the pros. It's like, no, you don't. He's not. Do, he didn't do it completely in the pros like he did in college. But he developed young quarterbacks, Patrick Mahomes, Johnny Menzel, and of course, Kyler Murray, elements of the air radar all over the NFL. 
So you can't, you can't deny that they're not there. And people are like, well, it's just dumping off path. It doesn't matter. It works. Right. So you, you look at what's going on there. Uh, and so you see that upside and then you see the downside of clicks cliff Kingsbury fired there in, in Arizona. I think he just got the role maybe too early. It's hard being a head coach versus a coordinator. And this is where, this is what Antonio Pierce is going to learn too coming into the season, right? He's, he's a rookie head coach. So everybody's got challenges. And so I think you look at this pool, nobody will not, not everybody will be happy no matter who, which way they go, but at least I like the direction they're going because I think mo- these guys with the exception of Getsy, and even then, you know, there's some good things about him, but overall, Mo, I think these guys are, they're not dated. I'll put it that way. They are sort of in the position to where they are at the forefront sort of, of where offenses are in the NFL and where they're going. Right. And what, what I will say about Van Pelt, and I guess well, some people want to know why I would be okay with Van Pelt is not only that the Browns, I believe put up 48 points in that playoff game that he called plays for because Kevin Stefanski had COVID, but also that he being under Kevin Stefanski and being in Cleveland, you understand that, the Cleveland Browns were a physical football team. So what did they have? Yes. They had a strong offensive line, and they ran the ball pretty well. What do you think Antonio Pierce wants to do? Probably wants a strong offensive line and wants to run the ball pretty well. So I think philosophy-wise, Alex Van Pelt would be a very good fit with Antonio Pierce. When it comes mm-hmm. to Cliff Kingsbury, I know some people are down on Cliff, Kings- Cliff Kingsbury, but look at his offenses in Arizona. May not have been the best head coach, but if you look at right. those offenses, they were top 11 in scoring and total yards back-to-back years. The Cardinals were a playoff contender. Now, they didn't win any playoff games. Kyler Murray wilted in the playoffs in, in the first round with pressure. But if you look at the production of those offenses under Cliff Kingsbury, you have to like what you see. My only thing is, how is, he's gonna, how is he going to mix that air raid offense with maybe Antonio Pierce's physical philosophy and wanting to run the ball? They'll have to marry those two ideals. But I will say that Cliff Kingsbury's offenses were efficient in the red zone. As he as time went on, they brought in James Conner, who came in, ran the ball yes. pretty well. He's a big bruising back. So he knows how to close the deal when it comes to uh, touchdown drives, scoring six points instead of three points, which the Raiders needed to do a lot more this past season in the past several years. Yeah, correct. And I think that, that when you people people mistake because it's got elements of the West Coast offense and the run and shoot going back a few years and this kind of wide open people people misconstrue it because it's called air raid. And so they look at numbers and they're like, well, it's not vertical. He said it, it's air rated. It's, ver- it's not vertical. There is verticals there. There's verts. There's 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 a, a wide open offense that allows for the quarterback. Now, in college, it's much more limited because in college, quarterbacks don't read defenses like they do in the pros. It's just it's just more difficult. So in college, the quarterback is given less freedom with air raid or a, a derivative of the air raid in the NFL. You give the quarterback more power. Right, you give the quarterback the ability to change the plays depending on what defense he sees back there, and so there is a lot of dump off passes. But that is the NFL today. When people criticize, well, there's going to be a lot of screen passes. That's how the NFL is because what the NFL has learned and what the air raid helped bring in is the fact that it's easier to pass the ball short than it is to run the ball. But to your point about Antonio Pierce, the run is important in the air raid. Actually, if you do it correctly and you do it physically, so you're right, melding them together would be an interesting mix. But if I had to bet today, Mo, I would say that it's going to be Van Pelt. And I think it's, I think it's because of his experience, right? Because I think he's been there, he's done it. And on that staff, I think you need that, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Now, developing young quarterbacks, all that, who knows? We'll see who they end up having as the quarterback coach. That could be a key part of this uh, when they bring in the offensive coordinator. So it'll be interesting. Um, And if, if we go through this entire week, which we're almost done with the week, and it doesn't happen, and then you go through next week and it doesn't happen, (laughs) then you got to believe they're waiting to to meet Clint Kubiak in person because everybody else has met with the Raiders in person. He's the only one who hasn't. The other thing about Alex Van Pelt is if you look at the Cleveland Browns and what they've done with David Njoku, he had a breakout year this past year. You would have to like seeing that with David Njoku. You would have to like the potential in Michael Mayer if you're bringing in Alex Van Pelt, assuming he brings in a lot of what he brings from Cleveland to Las Vegas, the common thread between Van Pelt and Kubiak is both could be known for running the ball pretty well. Clint Kubiak, of course, the son of Gary Kubiak, who's known for establishing the run. Of course, being under Cal Shanahan, who can run the ball 50 different ways, 
you have to believe he's going to bring some of that to Las Vegas if he's high. So I think the two philosophy, the two philosophic match, matches to Antonio Pierce, the best matches are Clint Kubiak and Van Pelt with Clint Kingsbury, as I said, having to mesh his air raid or derivative of the air raid offense with Antonio Pierce's philosophy. Yep. Well said. All right. Let's move on to quarterbacks now, right? The, 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 the biggest need of the Raiders and spare me the offensive. I know we need offensive line is the, the philosophy of the Raiders. Like they're saying, Hey, we, we do need to do that. I, I should say Raider fans. We need offensive line. This is what I hear them say. We need offensive line. Yes, they do. Especially depending as we talked about last show, who leaves in free agency, who do they resign? But Again, you got to get the quarterback. It's the NFL, folks. You got to get the quarterback. There is a, a a crop of quarterbacks this year that are very good, and the Raiders need to figure out what they're going to do. And we're going to talk about this segment. We're going to talk about the draft. So the young quarterbacks coming out that you've been hearing about this class. We'll get into that. Second segment, we're going to talk about the free agent pool. Not It's not a very deep pool, but it's a free agent pool nonetheless. We'll talk about that. And then the third segment, we're going to get to your voicemails and emails in the Raider Nation mailbag for this week. All right, Mo, let's dive in now, too, because I, I we, we talk about this quarterback class and, of course, the top three names. And and, and everybody knows these names because uh, we've been hearing about them since the start of the college football year. And what we have here up on the screen, and let me get this graphic off of here, uh, is the Raiders uh, and looking at top draft uh, quarterbacks in the draft. Of course, Caleb Williams, USC uh, and Drake May. And let me add too, if you're watching us, if you're listening, you won't see this, but you can check it on the video. But um, next to their school is a number. This is a number that I've averaged out amongst four or five different big board websites. So they rank all the players from one to 700 or whatever it is. Uh, and, and, and where the quarterback ranks in the top players in the entire draft. So that includes all positions. So, but as far as quarterback goes, number one, Caleb Williams, he's also the number one on the big board, right? Not a, not a surprise there. Number two is Drake May in North Carolina. He's the third player listed on the big board. Number three is Jaden Daniels. He's 11. Then you have Michael Penix Jr. at 20, Bo Nix at 22. J.J. McCarthy is the sixth-rated quarterback. He is positioned in the uh, 57 in the draft, so basically second round, low second round-ish. Then it, there's a big drop-off here, although a couple players that are that are very interesting – uh, Michael Pratt from Tulane at 75, and then Spencer Rattler from South Carolina at 93. That's the top eight quarterbacks. And you look at this, and Mo, you and I'm going to flash now on the screen too. Remember the Raiders draft pick. So look, top five quarterbacks, basically one through 22 is the range. You look at the Raiders picks. They have one pick in the top 22, okay? Not to say that they couldn't get a quarterback later and try to develop them, but if you want to get up and get one of the top quarterbacks that we just showed you in the top five of this, this pretty deep class, then guess what? Um, the Raiders are, are going to have to make some, some moves here, I think, Mo. But you look at that list of those players and, and, and who they are, and um, it's, it's going to be tough because everybody said, well, they got to trade up, got to trade, tra trade up. We talked about that. It's harder to do than it is to say it. Um, but when you look at that class and you look at those eight guys and the position the Raiders are in, what do you see? Uh, and I think I said this on Tuesday show that if the Raiders are going to stand pat at 13 or even move up to eight to leapfrog the Vikings and the Denver Broncos, the likely targets are Bo Nix and Michael Penix. So yeah. you, I think you would have to narrow it down to those two guys, assuming – Caleb Williams, Drake May, and Jaden Daniels all go one, two, and three. And I know mm -hmm. a lot of Raider fans don't want to hear that because they want one of those three top quarterbacks. But as I said, the only the only possibility that the Raiders get one of those three is if the Newman Patriots, who sit at three, don't like the third quarterback available among those top tier guys. Right. If that's if that's not the case, you're you're picking between a quarterback who has the has the pocket presence has the deep ball accuracy and Michael Penix, but has an injury history, or you're choosing Bo Nix, who's more reliable when it comes to availability in his collegiate career, but a lot of people criticize him for not having the arm. I will say that just because a quarterback, and this is usually applied to running backs, Jordan Reed of another network says this a lot, just because a player doesn't do something in college doesn't mean he can't do it in the pros. And it's usually attached to running backs who don't catch the ball a ton in, in college. And they say, well, he doesn't catch out of the backfield. Doesn't mean he can't. 
just doesn't mean he wasn't asked to do that on the collegiate level. With Bo Nix, I think you can apply the same principle where a lot of people says, well, he doesn't have a big arm, doesn't have deep arm accuracy like Michael Penix. And I will say, in Oregon, that was the offense. Screens and short passes. It doesn't mean that Bo Nix cannot stretch the field. That's what he was asked to do at Oregon. So I think with Bo Nix is going to be important, and I know he's down in mobile, um, it's going to be important for him to show that he has the arm strength uh, to get uh, to get the ball to receivers downfield, and I think that will increase his draft stock. Now, not dramatically because the film is the film, but I think people need to keep that in mind. That, as you said in the first segment or, or early in the show, that sometimes a quarterback can be handcuffed by the system and the coaching staff on the collegiate level, and then when he gets yeah. to the pros, he can do more if asked to do more. Correct. And I would also, to your point, now before people start saying, "Well, Mo, you just said." Doesn't mean they can't do it in the pros. Well, what about Aiden O'Connell? He can become more athletic. Different story, That's not right? We're talking <laughs> mechanics. We're talking about mechanics. Right. We're talking about uh, weight training, arm strength. Because remember, and I'll give an example. And I think even though he's a bigger guy, Bo Nix reminds me a little bit of of Drew Brees coming out of college. Because when Drew Brees, if you read the draft report on him, it was okay. He was smaller. Number two, he's six foot. Bo Nix is six two. Uh, and so you look at that, okay, that's one difference, but both had the same issue, which was a oh, good, can move the ball smart, you know, all the smarts you want from a quarterback, but his arm strength's a little weak. So what happens? Bo, uh, excuse me, not Bo Nix. Drew Brees goes into the combine in Indy and shows more arm strength than the film showed, right? So, so the pro scouts are there in Indy. They get to see him in person and run him through the drills And he surprises them. He surprises them with his arm strength, okay? And I think that's what Bo Nix is. I think he's close to that. I'm not saying he's going to be Drew Brees by any means, but I'm just telling you that I think that, to your point, that stuff like arm strength, footwork, uh, mechanics, those can all be fixed. So as fans, I've been engaging with a lot of fans online, are like, well, this player does this. Guys, doesn't matter what we think. (laughs) <laughs> the scouts are looking at different things. They're not looking, well, Caleb Williams, is he still the number one pick because they had such a terrible finish? Doesn't matter. They're looking at what he's going to do. Is he a leadership? They're going to sit down in his interview on pro his pro day and say, is this the guy we want to lead our team? They're going to run him through all the psychology, all that stuff. So they are going to look at it much differently. And I think Bo Nix is that situation. And that's why I think Bo Nix, and, and, and you're, you're a Knicks fan, right? You're a New York Knicks fan, mm-hmm. right? But I also know, I, I'm telling you, I, we had, you know, we call Mo Mostradamus, right? Because he has a way to see the future. And so sometimes, uh, he, sometimes most of the time, you're, you're pretty accurate. But he had a dream last night and we somehow we captured the image. And here's Mo. With, <laughs> oh, Mo's a Knicks fan. There's Bo Nix. Look, he's got his avocado smoothie. There's Mo and his Brooklyn gear in Vegas. They're enjoying themselves out in the sun. Anyway, people would say people would say those are Brooklyn Nets colors because they make fun of my <laughs> Brooklyn Nets hat, but we'll let, yes. we'll let that slide. But I, I, I really, I think you know what you're saying, and and this is why we show this draft board because I mean, if you look at it now, like you said, Mo, something crazy could happen, and stuff does happen. Guys fall not because they're bad players. There might be a, somebody might trade up for a different reason. Somebody might trade down for a different reason. Like you said, the Patriots might not like Jaden Daniels. And then suddenly the Raiders can trade from 13 to five or wherever, and they're able to go get him. Now, we do also know that uh, our friends at the L.A. Football Network reported, too, that um, that uh, that the Denver Broncos are very interested in trying to trade up and get Caleb Williams. Now, I people argue with me. I still say the Bears are going to take him. I don't care what anybody. Oh, no, they like fields. They want look. Either that or they're, if somebody gives them an unbelievable deal, of course they'll trade out. If somebody does the, the Herschel Walker type deal, okay, great. They'll take it. But other than that, I just, I mean, I'm willing to bet any, any amount to anybody that they're not going to trade out of that. So yes, that said, even Denver, even if they could trade up to two or three, like you said, the Patriots don't want, want Jaden Daniels or, 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 or whatever. The Broncos are going to be aggressive to get a quarterback. Okay. So the Raiders have to consider that too. But I do think at the end of the day, the guy that is most likely to end up a Raider, if they go quarterback in the first round, again, they might do something else. But if they do, I think Bo Nix is the safe bet at this point. And I don't think Raiders fans should be disappointed with that. Yeah, I would say Bo Nix is the safe bet 
simply because if you're wor- if you're skittish about Michael Penix's injury history, Bo, yeah. Bo Nix would be the option, right? Because that's going to be the knock against Michael Penix throughout this evaluation process is what are the medicals going to say about the condition of his knee? Because we hear all sorts of reports after the combine about a player's uh, injury history, mm-hmm. past injuries, recent injuries. Now, Michael, Michael Penix has been healthy recently, but it's been talked about ad nauseum about his knee and you know all the surgeries that he's had. So that's going to probably knock him off. That'll knock him completely off some boards. I yes. will say that. Some and, that will. Knock, and that will knock him to the second round on other boards. I don't know what, how the Raiders feel. As I said, Tom Telesco has, has a history of not really, I don't want to say not caring, but he doesn't mind drafting players with an injury history, but it's usually – other positions like safety, wide receiver. It's different with the quarterback because if you don't have your quarterback on the field, you know, it could be a big blow to your offense. So he may be a little more cautious about picking a quarterback with an injury history. Yeah. And if he is, I, again, as we reiterate, we think Bo Nix is probably the most realistic option. But if he's not worried about Michael Penix's knee, if the medicals aren't as bad as we think they are going to be about Michael Penix's knee, then Michael Penix joins in that, that discussion of he could be a possibility in the first round. Even if the Raiders do, let's say, trade back. Let's see if the Raiders are seeing other uh Michael Penix slip in the draft. Let's say he's he's not he he's passes the Raiders. Let's say he's still on the board at 20. Mm-hmm. Remember, the Raiders could still trade back up into the first round. We've seen teams do this. The Baltimore Ravens, when they got Lamar Jackson, traded back into the first round to get him. Right. So if Michael Penix does fall, don't don't say, well, you know, they're gonna pass on Michael Penix because they took a cornerback or offensive lineman at 13. They could still move up and get him if he if he uh, slips a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a higher risk. But again, I mean, looking at this list, Mo, uh, and this is the point I wanted to make before we close out the segment and get into the free agent discussion, which is the idea here that once you get past Bo Nix or Michael Penix, let's say you have them ranked flip flop, whatever, four or five. Once you get past five, there's a big drop off, right? And so, so you don't have to worry about if, if, if they like JJ McCarthy, I'm not saying they should, or they do, but let's say they do, you know, you don't have to, you you don't have to go. Now somebody could overreach and pick them. That always happens, but past five, past pick 22 or the 20 early twenties, then there's the drop off. So then at that point, you know, if, 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 if these guys are gone, if the five of those quarterbacks are gone in the first 12 picks, which I doubt happens, but let's just say it does for the sake of argument. Then you start saying, okay, well, yeah, we need a quarterback, but guess what? We got to go to plan B and uh, we're going to take somebody else in the first round to your point and then try to trade back into the back end of the first round uh, and, and, and try to, or, or just wait it out and you go with a McCarthy or somebody like that past McCarthy, Pratt Rattler. Those guys are all projects. Right. Cause then you're talking, you're talking Pratt projected third round. That's if he stays there, it could be fourth round. And then you're getting into Aiden O'Connell territory and you already got that. So now they're a little bit different as far as the style of play and their ability to be functional mobile, functionally mobile. So it's a different situation there, but it's going to be fascinating. And yes, everybody wants to go all in to get all up. But again, if you can't get anybody in the top three, let's say the top three teams will not move. Then you have two options, in my view, if you're going to go with a young quarterback this year. Uh, and if you can't get one of those two guys, then you got to go to plan B. And you might need to another, wait another year to try to get your franchise quarterback and, and piece it together. So that would be disappointing for fans. I get it. But, Mo, they have to have plan B. We're going to talk about that in the next segment when we get into the free agents. Yeah, Spencer Rattler is going to be an interesting evaluation. I felt like his first year as a starter at South Carolina was his best year. Yes. Kind of erratic after that. One name that you didn't have on the board, Joe Milton III out of Tennessee. Yes. Big arm guy, about 6'5", almost 250. People are going to look at him and go, wow, that that dude looks like a <laughs> you know, mini tight end right there. But yeah. he's he's one of those quarterbacks that has the big arm, just needs to work on his accuracy a bit, where Michael Pratt is kind of the opposite. Doesn't have a big arm, but is very accurate. So if the Raiders, get, as, as you said, get past those top names, it'll be interesting to see if they have a plan B to pick a quarterback in on day two. And if it is one of those guys, including McCarthy, because I'm sure there are some teams that have McCarthy as a first round pick as well. But I think he's a very late first round pick, early second round pick. Yeah. And again, the combine and pro days, depending, you know, Caleb Williams, not going to the combine. He's going to do a pro day. Um, He's not going to go to the, at least as far as I know, I haven't seen that he's going to the combine. Why would you? Right. Um, Instead, you just host, you're going to be the first pick anyway. It's not going to help you 
to do too much stuff. So you can dictate it by doing a pro day instead. Uh, and some of the other guys might do that. Drake may might do that. Top three quarterbacks may top five quarterbacks may do that. So we'll see. But I think, I think with Knicks and Panics junior, they have going to the combine could help, help, help them significantly. So for them, it makes sense to go. So we'll see how it all works out. I will be there. So I'm going to be up at the combine, uh, for at least a day or two. And so we'll, we'll get a look. Hopefully I can time it so I can see those guys, but all right. We're going to step aside. When we come back, Mo and I are going to get talk about the free agent market. I know you want to draft a quarterback. Yes, they have to draft a quarterback, I believe. But if something happens and they can't and they really need to think about it. And by the way, the quarterback room needs three people. Somebody argued with me. No, we got O'Connell. All we need is what drafted rookie. No, you need a veteran in there, too. So we're going to talk about veterans that are available in the free agent pool this year in the NFL. You're listening to Silver and Black today. We're coming back right after these words. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Do us a favor, make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio and to our YouTube viewers, or if you're watching us on uh, Twitch, or if you're watching us on Facebook or Rumble, wherever you are, thank you for being with us and we appreciate the chat and the comments and liking the video and subscribing to the channel. So thank you very much for that. Momo and Scott Branson back with you. We're talking Raiders quarterbacks. Yes, the future of quarterback for the Raiders here on today's show. Next segment, we're going to get to your voice. Yes, we're going to listen to you voicemails, read some emails in our, our popular Raider Nation mailbag segment coming up next. All right, Mo, we, talk about, we talked about the young cornerbacks last segment. Now we're talking about the free agent pool. We know a couple of them. Uh, of course, Kirk Cousins is the biggest fish out there as far as uh, free agents go. Kirk Cousins, I don't think, is a target or would be a target for the Raiders, not only because of the cost, but because of where he's at in his career. And I just don't see a great fit there. Now, we don't know who the offensive coordinator is. Maybe maybe there would be a fit with the the style of play. I just don't see a fit there for the Raiders. So let's look at, uh, and I want to get some of your comments here, Mo. Let's look at the top free agent quarterbacks as we show a graphic here, and I'll read it out for our listeners. Uh, the top eight, <laughs> and really, when you get past four-ish, it makes me nervous. Uh, Kirk Cousins, as I mentioned, number two, Baker Mayfield, of course, coming off a career year in Tampa Bay. I think he'll resign there. Ryan Tannehill, I know, I know. I think he's over the 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 hill as well. Excuse the pun. Garden Minshew, <laughs> At number four, Jacoby Brissett at five, Jameis Winston, who's interesting to me, and I predicted in my bold Raiders column at, at the beginning of the year that he would sign with the Raiders. I know, I know. And then number seven, Marcus Mariota. Remember him? And then number eight, Tyrod Taylor, who I think has been on like 15 NFL teams. So you look at that list, Mo, and 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 it doesn't really, it doesn't really excite you if the Raiders can't draft somebody. Uh, we know they need a veteran to bring in. You and I have been talking about Justin Fields, which has been very polarizing in Raider Nation. Some people like the idea. Some people hate the idea. But when you look at that free agent pool, yeah, not a lot of great options if you're Tom Telesco and the draft doesn't work out. Yeah, I'm, there, there were rumors about what Kirk Cousins is going to ask for on the market. He's probably, whatever the price is, he's going to be the most costly free agent quarterback available if the Vikings were to move on from him. Just remember, keep in mind, he's coming off of a torn Achilles, getting up there in age, not a very mobile quarterback. So if you're going to add a Kirk Cousins, you better have a, at least a solid offensive line. I think we agree on this. I think Baker Mayfield is probably going to wind up staying in Tampa, even though he lo he just lost his offensive coordinator in Dave uh, Canales. Uh, I think he stays in Tampa and has uh, another year, another solid year there. Maybe they promote Thad Lewis, who's also uh, you know a favorite of Raider Nation to be an offensive coordinator. Maybe Tampa promotes within keep and they keep Baker Mayfield and keep that offense rolling. Mm. But as you said, looking at this list is not very inspiring. The only thing I will say is that because the Raiders haven't hired an offensive coordinator yet, I want to see who they hire as a play caller because that play caller may want to bring in a veteran signal caller who's played in his system. Yeah. So once we know who the offensive coordinator is, then we can connect the dots on maybe you know who would they sign as a as a, a bargain bin or as a as a you know as a veteran free agent to come in and push Aiden O'Connor for the number two spot and possibly compete for the starting job along with the rookie. Yeah, that's where that's where I think uh, people people have to look at that and say, okay, when it comes to free agents, don't get too excited. There's just nobody who's going to move you. There might be somebody there who's serviceable, and then some people might argue, well, then why don't you just go with O'Connell, 
right? Because if if you're going to go, the difference is, to your point, offensive coordinator and the system, if there's somebody out there who runs the system, has more experience in it, and can move a little bit more in the pocket, even Jacoby Brissett can do that. I'm not advocating for Jacoby Brissett. I'm just saying he can. He can move a little more with his legs, even in his advanced years. But uh, but so so when you look at that, you have to kind of, I think, temper your expectations if that. One of the other names that's been out there, because it's he's going to be released – and it's interesting because people are bringing it up. When I when we brought it up a year ago, people were, were or two years ago, people were crazy, tell, calling us crazy. Is uh, Russell Wilson? The Broncos are going to release Russell Wilson and eat that massive, massive contract. Um, tell me what you think of Russell Wilson and some of these Raider fans and and folks who are questioning whether or not he would be a fit in Vegas. I, I question the fit in Vegas. I mean. Listen, I don't know Russell Wilson personally, but reading the reports of how he not that he was a bad person in Denver or Seattle, but the reports and form his former teammates, some of them say that he could be a bit standoffish. Now that doesn't that has nothing to do with his production on the field. A productive quarterback no. is a productive quarterback. Right. But you if you're building a culture, not to say that every player has to have the same personality, you have to be careful of whom you add who you're adding to the locker room. And yes. how that can change the dynamics of the complexion of a locker room, especially at a leader position, a leadership position like the quarterback spot. So, the, so you can add a a standoffish safety or cornerback, and it may not mean much. I mean, not to say those positions aren't important, but when you're again touching the football on every, every snap, yeah. and you have to be a communicator, all of that stuff matters. And I think I, I just don't see how Russell Wilson's personality matches with what the Raiders are building with their culture under Antonio Pierce. That's not to say that they won't consider him because if they're looking for a serviceable quarterback and they don't like Justin Fields or any other free agents that you put up on the screen a moment ago, then they may go with Russell Wilson if they feel like they're not going to get the quarterback of their choice in the draft. But I just don't see the fit beyond his personality and culture fit. I'll say this again. Russell Wilson is a, is a, is a smaller quarterback under six feet who doesn't deliver the ball a ton to the middle of the field or in the seam area. So, that can negate or slow down Michael Mayer's progression development because mm. Russell Wilson doesn't have a track record of, of throwing to his pass catching tight ends. You can look right. at his, his uh, seasons in Denver. You can look at his seasons in Seattle. You know, there, there were some flashes there with some of the tight ends that he's played with, but not a lot of high production in the passing game from him with the tight end. So I would be wary of Russell Wilson, especially when it comes to Michael Mayer's development. Right. And I, and I think it's not bad mouthing Russell Wilson to say this. Oh, I just think no, to your, to your point about culture, I think, I don't think he fits in with Antonio Pierce's vision for the team as he's articulated it to us. Right. That's not to say you can't be a quiet quarterback or more, like you said, more reserved, but on the field, you have to lead in a certain way. And I think the circus, and it's not his fault. The circus that comes with Russell Wilson too, uh, yeah. because of his wife's fame, because of his fame and all the stuff that he does at that point in his career, I, I don't, to your point about the locker room, I just don't see that as a fit. I think a rookie quarterback fits because a rookie quarterback's going to come in and have to earn his stripes. I think the right veteran coming in as well can fit as well. But I do think that with a quarterback, to your point, 100%, a quarterback's personality in this case will matter. And I think it's got to fit and mesh well with that locker room. Like I said, young player, they'll fit in, they'll figure it out, they'll be molded. A veteran player who comes in, I think, has to be somebody, even if they're a quiet leader, as long as they're 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 a leader and people see that and their reputation precedes them, okay. But I think the Russell Wilson thing, like you said, they could end up doing it if they have to. I just don't I, I don't see it happen. I, I bet you it's not top five on their list. And the other thing is when I look at this Raiders team, <clears throat> I, I get more of a blue collar vibe not to Correct. say that russell wilson isn't a hard worker but russell wilson is more of a like you say he he comes with some glitz and glamour so yes. he's won a super bowl before you know a lot of people if that's you're li living under a rock know who his wife is there's some type there's a <laughs> there's a level of celebrity that comes with russell wilson and the raiders just just aren't that right now and and that's that goes to my point about culture fit personality fit yes. and how and how a quarterback fits as in a leadership position with, with his football team. Right. And if you look at their three stars and I'm going to count Josh Jacobs in there until he's, um, um, officially not a Raider, they're all, if you look at their personalities to me, 
all lunch pail guys, including Devontae Adams, right? I mean, these are Devontae Adams, one of the best in the league. Max Crosby, one of the best in the league. Josh Jacobs, obviously one of the best in the league. Those guys are not flashy, right? They are, and, and I love that you made that point because I, I agree with you. And that's court, that's sort of, if you're going back to the old days, that's the Raider way, right? It's about just punching you in the mouth, going to work, working hard. And so, yeah, I think that's not the best fit for them. So we'll see what they do. Uh, I do. They have to bring in some veterans, um, at least one to go in that room. Uh, and it could be two, depending if uh, how the draft, if they, if they whiff in the draft on quarterback, then they're going to have to explore those avenues and we'll see what happens there as well. But they're going to have to clear that room off. Hoyer gone, Garoppolo gone. Garoppolo, people, oh, he's got trade value. He does not have trade value. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> and, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. I just don't the, see it happening. Scott, the only way I can see Garoppolo being traded is if they package him with a draft pick. Correct. That'll be the only that to me that'll be the only way it happens, and you see mm -hmm. this with certain players who don't have much trade value. Is you're gonna have to package them and entice other teams. Okay, we don't love Garoppolo his contract, but we want that draft pick, and it's gonna have to be a decent draft pick. I'm not talking yeah. like a sixth or seventh round. I'm talking no. like a you know, early mid round pick if they're gonna trade them. Probably right. Yeah, I just don't see that happening. But so we'll see. But that's the <laughs> lowdown on the the shallow free agent pool. I mean, it is what it is, folks. So we'll see what the Raiders do and, and what pops open. You don't know what players are available for trade. That's why we talked about the Justin Fields opportunity. Mo, is there anybody else out there from a trade perspective from a veteran that might not – I'm not talking about somebody who's going to cost you a first, second, or even a third round pick. Is there any veterans out there that might be worth thinking about from a trade perspective? To be honest, not that I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> I mean, I we, we, we talked about the two top – uh, well, the top trade option, which a lot of people are talking about, is Justin Fields. Mm -hmm. And I, and like you, I believe he will be available for trade once the Bears officially make it official that they're going to draft Caleb Williams. Scott, if you remember, the Bears put out a highlight video of Justin Fields. And a lot of people were reading into it to say, oh, they're keeping Justin Fields. They're trying to up his trade value. Listen. Justin Fields' film is out there. No highlight package is going to increase or devalue <laughs> his his trade his his trade buzz. It, right. To me, that looked like a thanks, but we're moving on type video. But other than Correct. other than Justin Fields, I think Russell Wilson could ultimately be traded. But we'll I, I don't think the Raiders should jump into that because there were reports saying that the Raiders may trade for Russell Wilson. I don't see that as a scenario because why would you want to bail the Broncos out of a bad contract or a contract that division. they're trying to get out of in yeah. your own division? I yeah. don't see a trade happening. An individual individual trades do happen, but mm -hmm. I don't see the Raiders and the Broncos uh, uh, making a transaction with Jeff, uh, Russell Wilson. I think ultimately the Raiders are going to either sign a veteran or they go after Justin Fields. Yeah, and there, there are. Remember, I, we gave you that list of free agents. There are others available. There's the Sam Darnolds of the world. I mean, you know, the guys that yeah. never kind of lived up, up to the potential. And so those guys are available too. Uh, but I didn't name them on there because I just didn't think they were somebody that the Raiders would go to because, you know, you, you, again, would I, would I take those guys over Aiden O'Connell? Probably not. I mean, some of them can move a little bit, including Wilson and Jones and these guys, but I, I just don't see any upside to them when you have a guy in house that you picked in the fourth round, I think could do just as well. So that's why we kept it to that. But anyway, that's the discussion on quarterback. We'll see. It's going to be fascinating. And we're going to have to wait until the draft and see what goes on between now and then. It's only a month away. Now that we're in February, today is the 1st of February. Of course, tomorrow's Groundhog Day, just in case you guys forgot. So we'll <laughs> see. <laughs> we'll see what happens over the next month. All right, we're going to take our final break. When we come back, we're going to get to your calls and your emails on the Raider Nation mailbag. You're with Scott and Mo. This is Silver and Black Today. Do not go anywhere. Coming right back. Raider Nation is never shy. You ask, we answer. It's time for the Raider Nation mailbag. What's on your mind, fam? Drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Now, it's your time to speak up. All right, that's right. We're back. We're here with the mailbag. Always fun. Got a lot of stuff, Mo. We're going to have to roll through these because... We got, uh, what, six calls? Seven. Seven. This means Just if I start time. rambling, if I start rambling, it means you got to tell me to shut up. Yes. 
I will do that. <laughs> you, can, you can do the same for me. We'll keep each other. We got we got some some usual suspects on today's show too. Uh, repeat callers, a surprise caller uh, as well. Some girl named Monique. Stop it. I, I I don't know. She says she knows you. I don't know. Stop it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> having fun. Having fun. All right. So let's roll with this. We'll get to the calls um, and uh, great stuff coming up. Okay, first up is our buddy Nodak Raider, who I believe is in North Dakota. So he's freezing his ass off. You nice. know that. You get, he's got to be. But anyway, here comes Nodak Raider, our first call up on the Raider Nation mailbag. Oops. It would help if I... Crazy offensive idea. Oops. Cliff Kingsbury is offensive coordinator. Russell Wilson is quarterback. This will stir the pot. Cliff Kingsbury is an easy offense to know, understand. It's a college offense. Russell can handle that. Russell cheap. Signed to a league minimum deal. The rest of his $40 million contract is paid by the Broncos. Signs for one or two years. You draft a quarterback, J.J. McCarthy. He's young. He's 21. He'll be 23 if you sit him for two years. Do the Jordan Love routine. He becomes your starting quarterback in two years. Devontae may not like that idea, but we need a quarterback for the future, not necessarily this moment, if we want to win Super Bowls in the future. Thanks. All right. There's no Dak Raider. I don't know that I agree with anything he said there, but I respect it. Thank you, Dak no Raider. You love it? He he touched all the third rails with that quarterback play. It was awesome. Raider- why, do you think, <laughs> why do you think I played it first? <laughs> Russell Wilson is a polarizing quarterback target with the Nation, and so is J.J. McCarthy. And then also <laughs> Cliff Kingsbury, people push back on that. So he touched every third rail with his plan. Though I love I love the fact that he goes out, he went out there and put out his idea. I yes. I, I will say did his research. That's not, right. And he did he definitely did his research on this before yeah. he made the call. So shout out to him for that one. Yes. It's not a plan that I would implement personally, yeah. but I like the fact that he came on here with a plan. And and I will say this, that while I said in the second segment that Russell Wilson is not a fit, that's not to say the Raiders, they may disagree with my opinion on that. They may they may right. think he is a fit. So I, I'm not going to write off the Russell Wilson thing. I just don't see it happening. I actually like Cliff Kingsbury as an OC. A lot of people say he failed as a head coach in, in Arizona. And as, as I said on, on the X, some 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 guys just make a better offensive coordinator than they do head coach. Yeah. Let's also remember that the Cardinals did be did become a playoff team on his watch. So he wasn't terrible. Mm-hmm. It didn't last long for him, but his offenses were pretty good in Arizona out there in the desert. So I don't I don't dislike the Cliff Kingsbury idea at all. Um, yeah. as I said, I question Russell Wilson's fit. I'm not a big JJ McCarthy guy. Me I either. will dig deeper into his film and give a full, you know, full assessment of him. But what I do worry about with J.J. McCarthy was, as I said in the second segment, or in the first segment, just because a quarterback doesn't do something in college doesn't mean he can't do it in the pros. But you do question, you know, can he carry an offense? Now, you're probably saying he doesn't have to carry an offense if you have a strong run game. But with, in Har- and with Jim Harbaugh at Michigan, had a strong defense. Raiders have a pretty good defense. And he had a run game there. So you wonder, you know, how much can he do in an offense? How much can he handle – now, I know the caller said that with King, Cliff Kingsbury, he has a digestible offensive system Then in, in, in the, on the collegiate level and in the pros. So you wonder how much J.J. McCarthy can do. I will say that you're going to like his his physical tools. J.J. Yeah. McCarthy can move. Yes. Yes. He has, you know, he has the talent there. He's, he's the prototypical modern day quarterback. And a lot of some teams are going to like that. Yeah. And I think, too, the one thing with Kingsbury, and I agree with Nodak Raider on that one, is that um, – you know, a lot of folks are out because to your point, and this is so important because you got, I think people look at things and they look so myopically. So yes, Cliff Kingsbury failed as a head coach. That has nothing to do with his offensive mind. He didn't right. fail in Arizona because his offense was terrible. Now, if that happened, I'd, I'd understand you having that point of view. I even brought up Johnny Manziel because he, he was his offensive coordinator the year Johnny Manziel won the Heisman Trophy. And I got... Manziel sucked. Yes, in the pros he did, but that, <laughs> but that has nothing to do with Cliff Kingsbury. When he was his offensive coordinator, he won the Heisman <laughs> Trophy. So, so you're going to tell me that Cliff Kingsbury had nothing to do with that? 
BS. He did. So anyway, and again, we talked about a lot of coordinators and that. But no, Dak Ryder, thank you very much. All right, got to move on, Mo. To your point, we're both getting diarrhea in the mouth. This guy, this is a guy who I'm worried because I think he's stalking me. So here we go. Uh, hey, Scott and Mo. My name is Murph. I'm a big <laughs> fan of the show. Uh, first time, long time. <laughs> and I just wanted to call and say that there is a <laughs> massive debate amongst Raiders fans on the social medias where typically arguments go to like just live forever, right? Because no one ever just agrees with each other and gets along. And also no <laughs> one's ever changed their mind on social media based on someone else's posting. But anyways, I digress. Yep. There is a large debate going on to wow, wow whether Raider fans are rooting for the Chiefs or we're rooting for the Niners. And while <laughs> oh, all of us gosh. can agree, certainly we're rooting for neither of them, it seems to be that there's a large contingent of old school Bay Area folks that uh, that are rooting for the, the, the Chiefs to win. I, I'm not going to tell any fan how to fan, and it's everyone's prerogative who they root for. But even as an old Bay Area, Bay Area guy myself, I'm going to be – well, I'm not rooting for anybody, but I'll be rooting for the Chiefs to lose just because we hate them so much. But <laughs> I come to you with a little bit of a silver lining. I'm thinking it may not be the end of the world if the Chiefs do win. And the reason why I say that is that rarely do players and coaches get a chance to call their shot and walk off into the sunset. And wouldn't it be amazing if Andy Reid and Travis Kelsey <laughs> packed it up and went to the house after winning the Super Bowl? So as unfortunate as that may be, it would spell good things for our chances in the league and in the division going forward. We already know we can beat them at their best but it would clearly give them a disadvantage versus the rest of the league and the rest of their schedule. So anyways, I'm going to go crawl back into my dark hole of depression. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've not watched the NFL for at least a couple of weeks. So oh. my blood pressure can chill out. Okay. Love you guys. See you. Bye. All right. There's our buddy Murph from Raiders fan radio. You can always, you, you can always count on Murph to bring you the positive side of almost anything. Uh -huh. And that's that's why we love him. That's why he does our post game show with us during the year for the Voice of the Van segment. So, uh, I go ahead. I I almost sent out an SOS for Murph because I didn't know where he was going with that when he said the, the silver lining to the Chiefs win. I was like, somebody needs to check on Murph. He's, he's talking about <laughs> silver linings for a Chiefs win. I don't know uh, where this is going, but he that's but he the brought only it one. back. And he and he and he and he made a point that a lot of people are talking about that. Maybe Andy Reid and Travis Kelsey right off into the sunset if they win the Super Bowl. Because what more does Andy Reid have to prove at this point if he does win another Super Bowl in Kansas City? What right. more does Travis Kelsey have to prove at this point? Seven straight seasons over a thousand yards, four time All Pro, multiple Super Bowl rings. They can both say, "Look, you know this run was is, was our best run because a lot of people doubted us. Instead of being the favorites." We had to go on a roll for the first time. We were underdogs in our last two games. This is the way we want to go out. We, we we overcame a lot of the naysayers. We have nothing else left to prove. We have nothing else left to show. We're older in our careers. We could just walk off. And I will say that would be that would be great for the division because you're taking away you know a, a future Hall of Famer, two future Hall of Famers at their respective positions. But I will say you still have to deal with Patrick Mahomes. And yes. depending on who the offensive coordinator head coach uh, will be, uh, still you'll still have those battles. But I agree with Murph. It, it would be less of – I will say that Raiders fans wouldn't miss Travis Kelsey running wide open for another 25-yard pass down the middle again. No. No one's no one uh, consistently has been able to contain him. So there you go. All right, Murph, thanks, man. We appreciate you, and we'll see you uh, next week on Raiders Fan Shout Radio. Or when you guys do a yes. show, they, they do it less frequently during during the offseason, which you can understand. So, all right. Next is our good friend. You and I always go back and forth with him on on X, and that is our good buddy, Rock Raider. What up, Miss right. Tomo? What up, LB Gully? It's your boy, Rock Raider 585. I just had a quick question. You think it would be a foolish move for them to wait for Clint Kubiak for the San Francisco 49ers? Or... or make a rough decision to get an offensive coordinator so they can get the ball rolling. Me, myself, personally, I, I would love the, the Kubiak hire. I would, anything Shanahan, we, we can get on offense. For the Raiders, I think that would be that would be amazing, especially with all the weapons we have. But that's the only question I have for today. I just want to say what's up to my boys, my guys, and you guys have been working so much that I really don't, really don't be interacting with you like you used to, but I'll still be listening to every show. Y'all take care. Rock Raider 585, out. All right, there you go. Love that guy, man. He works his butt off. And hey, yeah. 
All good, man. You got you got to provide for you and yours. So uh, that's that. Never need to explain that. And um, always, always. Good. And he brought up a good point there, Mo. To me, which is, do they wait? I think. I think. Look, my philosophy. This is a life philosophy, not just football. Okay. Never make choices just because you need for expediency, right? There are some choices in life you have to make. You have a decision, split decision. You got to make it right there. But in this case, I don't think so. If they really like Clint Kubiak and they want to wait to meet him. Yes, they run the risk of losing other people, but guess what? If that's the guy you're really interested in and you can't move on without first talking to him, then you got to wait. First of all, I'll say Rock Rock Raider 5 and 5. We, I got to get you back up to New York because you lost your New York accent. You sound <laughs> Southern, bro. I, you, we got to bring you Uh-oh. back to... We got to bring you back to Brooklyn or the Bronx. We got to get you a New York accent back. That's number one, but shout out to you. But uh, no, but in all seriousness, I, I think it's a good question simply because, as you said, do you wait with the with the with the risk of what if Clint Kubiak doesn't want the job? What if you interview Clint Kubiak yes. and he's not interested? He wants to do he wants to go in another direction and Van Pelt and Kingsbury, you know, sign up for jobs elsewhere. Then what are you going to mm-hmm. do? What's plan B? So I think when in this case, it depends on how much the Raiders want Clint Kubiak. If he Correct. is they're number one by a wide margin, then you wait mm-hmm. for that guy to, to come over because if you know you don't want to have the hindsight of what if we had just waited for Clint Kubiak? Because if he goes somewhere else and he's super successful, then you're like, We we had that guy at the top and we let him go because we were hasty. So I think if if he is their number one, you wait for you wait for him, you know, to to handle his business in the Super Bowl. If he's not and he's maybe you know, one B to Van Pell, one B to Cliff Kingsbury, then you pull the trigger and you hire one of the other two guys. But it's going to be an interesting decision because I'm sure they're, they're those are the three guys we talked about. And of course, Luke gets he's in the discussion as well. But I'm sure the Raiders have other offense coordinators they're considering just in case mm-hmm. they are targeting Clint Kubiak and he doesn't want the job. Yeah, but very important role because the Raiders yeah. offense has been broken, extremely yeah. broken. So they, they've got to fix it. Okay. We're moving on at Rock Raider 585. Thanks, man. We appreciate you. Appreciate you calling in. Get you it's, back to Brooklyn, bro. <laughs> Brooklyn. Back. Hey, come on now. Okay. <laughs> so then we go. Now we're going back out to the West Coast. Victor in the Central Valley. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, this is Victor here from the big Central Valley, California. Listen, uh, I was wondering if uh, the Raiders might be targeting a quarterback in the first round, maybe the second round. And now that we have Tom Telesky as our general manager, do you think that he might pick up somebody like a Justin Herbert style? And if that's the case, uh, who would this quarterback be? I would uh, see if you guys would like to comment on that. All right. There you go. Victor from the Central Valley. All right. Appreciate you calling in. And yeah, I mean, we talked about it earlier in the show, but I think that yeah, a Justin Herbert type quarterback would be fantastic for the Raiders but I think that's why we look at the guys in the draft this year and I I look at like a Bo Nix I mean he's not Justin Herbert of course he he doesn't have the same intangibles but he is a very talented guy I think that's the kind of guy that you see or that at least from our projections based on the earlier discussion Victor that uh, that we see in in a Raider uniform if they go in the first round so what I think Victor's asking is, do you, do we think that Tom Telesco has a type? Because we hear certain general managers have a type of player yep, they yep. want at every position. So I, I guess he's asking, does does he have a type of quarterback that he likes? And Justin yes, Herbert, it's functionally mobile. <laughs> yes, because that's what Justin <laughs> Herbert is. Right. Justin Herbert is also a big quarterback. Big uh, yeah. He, not necessarily. I think a lot of people assume that he stretches to fill the ton with a big arm. Mm-mm. Didn't do that a lot in Los Angeles. But the athletic profile, you could see he's he's a modern day type of quarterback who can do it all if necessary. And I think if you're looking at quarterbacks in the draft where the Raiders are going to be picking, there's no Justin Herbert that's going to be available at at 13. Nobody is six uh, six. Right. So you, I talked about Joe Milton who has a big arm. He's six five, about two fifty. Uh, as far as another uh, day two quarterback, Spencer Rattler, who had a better tenure in Oklahoma under Lincoln Riley, as I said, I, I should have said his first year in Oklahoma was probably his best year, but erratic, but he doesn't have the stature. Uh, he's a, he's a more of a slender quarterback, I believe about six one. So there, just to look at the quarterback list this year, there are a lot of quarterbacks on the slender side, even Jaden Daniels. When you yeah. talk about when the discussion comes about, about Jaden Daniels, the knock against him is, Oh, he's slender. He's about 185. We'll see what he weighs at the combine. But 
to, to answer Victor's question, uh, you could get the athleticism of a Justin Herbert where the Raiders are picking, but not necessarily the size and the athleticism combined. I, I think Justin Herbert is 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 Justin Herbert. There's only one Justin Herbert, of course. When it comes to the profile of the quarterback, it'll be hard to find that where the Raiders are picking. But I will say, Tom Telesco got Justin Herbert from where? Oregon. Oregon. Where Bo is Nick. where did, where is Bo Nix play right now? Yeah. Yeah. Oregon. You don't scout you don't scout the school, you scout the player, but I'm just saying <laughs> he was willing to dip into that Oregon pool before. Let's see if he's willing to do it again. Correct. And I mean, you look at to your point about a Justin Herbert, I mean, that size. Minton's the only guy, Milton's the only guy that is close to that size right. in this class. But mm-hmm. you look at Bo Nix. Bo Nix is basically, I think he's an inch shorter. But he's about the same size as C.J. Stroud. And I would say build-wise, C.J. Stroud might have a little more beef on him, uh, yeah. but but not close. I mean, it, but I should say it's close. So I think they're they're comparable, not talent-wise per se, but but size-wise from that and the mobility-wise as well, right? Because C.J. Stroud is not a running quarterback and neither is Bo Nix, although Bo Nix can run, I think, a little better than C.J. Stroud actually but he also uh, can move around in that pocket and create. So great. Victor, great call. Now we go back out uh, to the, the frigid Midwest, and we're going to talk to our good friend Dominique in St. Louis. Dominique is always on the YouTube channel having fun in the chat. So here he is. Hey, Scott and Mo. This is Dominique from St. Louis. Uh, appreciate all you guys do. Appreciate your honest and realistic views. I got a pro- uh, quick solution, I think, to the quarterback position. Let me know what you guys think. First and foremost, of course, keep AOC on the roster. Um, secondly, I would like to do everything possible to trade up for Jaden Daniels. Um, thirdly, I would like to bring in a vet. Um, that vet I would bring in is Marcus Mariota. Uh, hear me out. He's not a scrub. Uh, he'll be cheap. Uh, he signed for a one-year deal uh, for $5 million before this year with the Eagles. So I, I think we can get him cheaper than that, maybe three and a half, four, four and a half million. He'll be a great locker room guy. Um, he's a, he can be a great mentor. Um, he will push these guys. I say let all three of these guys compete. Um, he's only 30 years old. Uh, he's mobile. He started games in this league. He's had success. Uh, I know it was a long time ago, but in college, he did play in kind of a spread air raid offense. Uh, I know we're talking about getting Cliff Kingsbury. Uh, but let me know what you think about that. Have Marcus Mariota, Jaden Daniels, and ALC. Let all three of those guys battle it out. Uh, may the best man win. Uh, but just let me know what you guys think about that. Uh, thanks. Talk to you later. All right, Dominique St. Louis. Appreciate the call, man. Uh, send some emos. Uh, but listen, so you look at his point of view here. So we talked about this earlier in the show about a veteran coming in. And if the Raiders did move up and get a Jaden Daniels, then the veteran you're going to have behind him if you couldn't get like a Justin Fields, which I still am a fan of, at least trying, then somebody like Marcus Mariota, I know he the relationship he had with the Raiders was the was was under the Gruden regime, um, would be interesting. I'm not saying that he is a guy that's going to come in and start for you per se, but for all the reasons Dominique said, the cost, the leadership, of course, the Hawaiian community in Las Vegas is massive. You guys know that from the first time he was there. Uh, what do you think of Dominique's uh, little plan there? So I'm going to put on my tinfoil hat for me with Dominique's <laughs> theory. Now, while I, I, I pause when he mentioned Marcus Mariota, but I will say I'll, I'll connect it to this. There have been people in Philadelphia who have DM me, messaged me and said, Hey, what's going on with these Ch- Kelly rumors that the Reds may be interested in Chip Kelly as an offensive coordinator. It apparently has been talked about over there in, in on Philadelphia radio. Mm. And I will say, who did Chip Kelly coach at Oregon? Oh, I forgot. In 2012, that guy? Marcus Mariota. So yeah. if the yeah. if the rumors, if there's something to these rumors, and Chip Kelly becomes the OC of the Raiders, I could see him reuniting with Marcus Mariota again. It was yeah. only one year they were together in 2012 when that team went 12 and one. But here we go again. We're talking about another Oregon quarterback yeah. coming to the Raiders. And I and I, if I were to put on my tempo hat. Because I, well, I don't see Marcus Mariota. I understand Dominique's logic, though. Mobile quarterback, he's he's going to be a backup. He's not going to be your solution mm-hmm. at the quarterback position long term, obviously. But just a, a mobile quarterback who can get you through and fill you in and push Aiden O'Connell, I, you know, fi- I'm totally fine with that. 
Yeah. But I, I just decided to take Dominique's theory a step further and I just put on my uh my tip my tinfoil hat to say, what if the Chip Kelly rumors have something to them? And then if 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 they do, then you can see the connection. You can connect the dots between he and Marcus Mariota. Yes, and and the Chip Kelly conversation has been out there. We haven't talked about it a lot because it is it is complete rumor, right? But right. but like you said, your Philly folks are hitting you up about it. There's yeah. some other people who've reported. Oh, there's a secret candidate. It's like we all know who that is. Like it's not a secret. We know who it is. It's Chip Kelly. <laughs> um, and so if that's going to be Chip Kelly, fine. Chip Kelly leaving UCI, it'd be really interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't see it happening, but you never, I mean, people make crazy moves all the time. I say crazy, not in a bad way, but, you know, decide to disrupt themselves and do something different with their career all the time. So if that happened, yeah, it's a good, good connection there, Mo. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Dominique. We appreciate it. Now we go to our good friend, Tarek. We'll see where he is now because he travels a lot on business. I'm going to say he's somewhere in the center of the country from Dakota to Texas. I don't know. We'll see. Good evening, Scott, good evening, Mo. This is Tarek checking in with you guys in Lubbock, Texas, here this week for work. Uh, the one thing I dreaded was the Niners uh, and the chefs meeting in Allegiant Stadium, especially the chefs. I mean, Super Bowl 58, you got to tip your hat to both those teams, especially Kansas City, four Super Bowl appearances mm. in five years. Antonio Pierce, man, you got your work cut out for you. You're in a division with some big league head coaches, Andy Reid, now Harbaugh, Sean Payton. Uh, I do I do anticipate the Raiders coaching staff will be rounded up by the end of this week. I do like the fact that Antonio Pierce is relying on some proven veterans such as Marvin Lewis and Tom Coughlin, and it does seem that, like the Raiders are having um, a different type of approach to their front office. They're bringing in a lot of consultants like Richard Seymour, et cetera. Um, I want to get your thoughts on what you guys think about the, uh, the quarterback position. I mean, we've got to get it right, especially considering how heavy – the AFC is with great quarterbacks. Uh, there are so many multiple approaches. There's the route of free agency. You got Kirk Cousins, uh, Justin Fields, Russell Wilson, um, and then obviously, um, if you if you forego the free agency period and put all your chips in, in, on the table for for um, a quarterback in the draft, there's a lot of rumors that Jaden Daniels is, is going to be heavily connected to uh, the Raiders. He has history with Antonio Pierce as well as Marvin Lewis. Um, guys like Mike Mayock have the t Raiders taken a defensive player uh, with their 13th overall pick. Um, but we got to get it right at the offensive coordinator position, um, and we also have to get it right with the quarterback position. Um, I want to know uh, what you guys think about what the most sensible approach is going to be with regards to acquiring a quarterback. Again, they can take a free agent quarterback as well as draft a quarterback and groom him for a year. I could easily see a scenario where Russell Wilson uh, comes to Vegas um, I think he would be an upgrade, uh, obviously, over what we've had. Uh, so would Fields and Cousins, to be honest with you. So let me know what you guys think about the quarterback situation. Uh, have a great week, and I look forward to your show uh, later on this week. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. All right, there you go. Uh, Tarek, appreciate your call, man, as always. And I know, and, and you're probably hearing your call now and saying, well, they already talked about this. But just to reiterate, I think I think he's on the same page we are, which is, yeah, you might throw some different names out there, but draft a young quarterback, get the best one you can, Go either sign a free agent or trade for one, i.e. Justin Fields, uh, and keep AOC, and then just let the three of them go at it, Mo. Right. May the best quarterback win the competition at training camp. Just an open cop, And that's why I'm I'm on board with, as, as Derek said, bringing in a veteran and drafting a quarterback. Just because yes. you trade for a veteran or, or sign a veteran doesn't mean you're not drafting a quarterback. I want to make that very clear when we talk about acquiring a veteran. It's Correct. not one or the other. You do both. Mm -hmm. And you just have them all compete. And again, best quarterback wins the competition. So I'm on board with that. He also brought up Russell Wilson, who our, our previous uh, callers and people have, have brought up. That mm -hmm. seems to be a popular name right now. The other thing about Russell Wilson, I'll say, is he's used to being a starter wherever he's been, right? The unquestioned starter. Unquestioned, how yes. would How would he feel if he's coming into a situation where the team will likely – most likely draft a quarterback and he's going to have to be the bridge guy, which means his time there isn't necessarily guaranteed to be long-term. Is he going to be okay with that? Or does he want to go somewhere where he is once again, the unquestioned starter? I think that's one point that we need to bring up that needs to be discussed because as much as, as you could say, yeah, he's an upgrade. He's got to want to like the situation as well. So if he can go somewhere where he doesn't have to look over his shoulder at a rookie quarterback, he may choose that team over the Raiders, especially if he believes or thinks the Raiders are going to draft the quarterback 
early because you assume when you draft a quarterback in the first round that that quarterback could start at any moment from his rookie year to his second year. So right. Russell right. Wilson's runway could be very short it, if he goes to Las Vegas. The, the other thing too, and and I, I hear this thrown out with Russell Wilson all the time, and then we'll close on this one and we'll get to our last call, which is, okay, he's going to get all that money. He's going to get released from Denver. He's going to get all that money, so he'll take the league minimum. <laughs> Who says? If there's four teams that want Russell Wilson, you think he's good? The league minimum is $1.65 million for somebody, a veteran of his experience, okay? So um, if that's the case, why would you think he'll play for the minimum? You think he's going to be so desperate he's going to play for the minimum? There's going to be other teams that will sign him. Trust me. So this idea that he's going to – so then you start getting up to three, four, five million dollars $5 and you're like, well, wait a minute. If I can get to Justin Fields or I can get somebody else for that, why would I do – so let's just be realistic about the money too because he's not going to come for a $1 million. He's just not going to do it. It doesn't matter how much they're paying him. That's irrelevant. When you sit down and negotiate with a team, Mo, you don't say, well, I've got $40 million over here, uh, so we're not going to pay you anything, Russ. We're going to give you the minimum because you're already making a lot of money. He doesn't give a crap. You're going to pay me what I am worth on the market, whatever that market dictates. If that market dictates, it might be $15 million, Mo. It it might be. And I and to, to Tarek's call, I, I want to say that I understand why Raider fans would be interested in Russell Wilson. If you look at his numbers, his numbers weren't bad this past year. 26 no. touchdown passes, only eight interceptions. So he he is a serviceable upgrade over what the Raiders have right now. So I understand the draw to him. But there are, let's just understand, there are going to be some hurdles, some financial questions, some fit questions about him uh, and where he wants to go and his desire to where he wants to land. Absolutely. Well said. All right. Thank you, Tarek. Appreciate it. On to our last call. And then we got an email to get to as well. This is Andrew up in Oakland. Old school Oakland up there. Let's hear Andrew. Hey, this is Andrew again from Oh, Andrew. Sorry. And I said Andrew. Put this on air because I know you're tired of me. But <laughs> this whole Aiden O'Connell talk is nonsense. Um, yes, I mean, it is. Supposedly, he is super accurate. I guess I watched him play in a number of games. And I think his accuracy is okay, but he threw behind guys all the time. Secondly, <laughs> these conference finals, it, 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 it's not that. Oh, call broke up a little bit. And number three, this is not like a participant trophy league. <laughs> yeah, he's a nice guy. And yeah, we like to, you know, give everybody their shot and all of that and make him feel good and all this. Uh, you know, this isn't little league. Uh, we obviously have to get a quarterback, and there's, I, I, I can't point to any reason as to why you should have, uh, give, you know, give this guy the starting job. There's, I can't see one reason. Anyway, be good. All right. There you go. Andre, sorry for calling you Andrew at first. I wrote it down incorrectly. Uh, but Andres, always welcome to call, man. Just because you call it, you can call in every week. If it's a good call, we're going to put it on. So all good. But yes, yeah, so this is where I keep getting, and it, it seems to be, especially here on YouTube. Oh, we have O'Connell. He can start. No, no. And we like, again, we like Aiden O'Connell. We, we, he can develop into a better quarterback, spot starter who can win you games in a crunch. Okay. But he cannot, he cannot do more than what God gave him to do. You cannot suddenly become functionally mobile when you have his legs. You just can't mow. Here's the deal with Aiden O'Connell. He will compete for the position, but you're not handing over the offense to him as the yes. unquestioned starter next year. He did enough where you can say, okay, he's made some progress. He can develop into something, a spot starter, what have you. But you're not saying, oh, we're, we're good at quarterback because we got Aiden O'Connell. No way. No way. And as I said in a previous show, there are some that are pointing to the Chiefs game and saying, well, the Raiders beat the Chiefs with Aiden O'Connell as their quarterback. And Aiden O'Connell had a pretty good first game against the Chiefs. But I want to reiterate this. He didn't complete, complete a pass after the first quarter in that second game where the Raiders beat the Chiefs in Arrowhead. Did not complete a pass after the first quarter. He also had a clunker against Minnesota. So while he had some good moments, we cannot forget some of the some of the some mm -hmm. of the bad moments that he had. And it's it's enough of those those ups and downs that we could say he is not the guy right now. Now, can he? Is it fair to say he could compete? Sure. If he surprises everyone at training camp and is the best quarterback on the field in the practice field in the summer, fine. So be it. But you're not passing up on this year's draft class and veterans, and you know, just to say, Aiden O'Connell is a guy. He didn't do enough to warrant that. Yes. 
And please do not compare to Tom Brady. Oh, my gosh. Well, Tom Brady wasn't very good his first year. Well, his first year only played one game. His second year, he went 13-3. and three. So, I mean, come on. Let, let, let's be real. Good kid, good developmental quarterback. Yeah. And that's why yeah. you take a guy in the fourth round. You don't take him. Yeah. Now, sometimes it works out. You never know. Somebody hits lightning in a bottle, boom. But uh, anyway, so there he goes. All right, let's get to this last email before we shut out the show here. Um, this one says, Dear Scott and Mo." Love your show, but I have a couple questions regarding your QB discussion over the past few weeks. Boy, people want to talk about quarterbacks. Um, first, you keep talking about Justin Fields, whom I like, he says, but I'm concerned that any deal, and most of what I see talk about is a, a trading a second round pick or a third, would limit the ability of the Raiders to move up, which require multiple first and second round picks. Unless one is willing to go forward with Fields long term, is it worth it, especially for any deal before the draft? Second, you have not mentioned Russell Wilson as a possibility of a vet to compete for the starting job. I was never a big fan of his, but he was not terrible last year. There is no need to give up a pick by uh, by no means in the division, and we will even he will be even cheaper than Fields. Not to mention, I like the ideas of the donkeys paying most of the salary for the Raiders QB, <laughs> and he does have functional mobility, right, Mo? Um, why don't Why don't you think of this as a viable alternative? As you've mentioned, Cousins in the past. Thanks, guys, and keep up the good world. That's that's Docs. That's the emails from Docs. We appreciate your email, Docs. And um, so a couple things here. Number one, I'm going to go back and just push on. I'm going to start with the Russell Wilson. Nothing says Russell Wilson will be that cheap. Justin Fields, now we'll get into the draft pick thing in a second, Mo, to get your take on this, but Justin Fields next year would cost you $6 million, okay? Russell Wilson, Russell Wilson may cost you 10 So. There's the money thing. We don't know how much Russell Wilson's going to be. He's not going to play for the league minimum. I don't care. That would he play for the league minimum if no one else would sign him, and I think someone else would sign him. Now, Mo, on the Justin Fields situation, second round pick, I would not be in favor of that. A nope. third round pick, I think, is a good price for Justin Fields. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about does it hamper you in trading up for a quarterback this year? No, because you can always trade future compensation. And that's the point I was going to make is that. You can all if you let's say the Raiders want to move up to I don't know eight, right? Let's say they want to move up to eight. It, it's not going to cost you a bunch of a boatload of picks to move up five spots. Now, if you're moving up to three, going to cost yeah. you a lot more. And and for the most part, when you see those trades where teams move up into the top three or top five, they're giving up future first round picks. So that'd be the first round pick in 2025. You know, a second round pick of 2025. And sometimes you see it two years down the line. But mm -hmm. I, I will say that giving up a third round pick shouldn't hinder the Raiders from moving up if they want to, because you always have the 2025 draft capital to dig into if you really want to move up to a high spot in, in the order. Correct. And to me, you give up the capital if it's the quarterback you think is going to be there for 10 years or longer. Okay. If it's a defensive end, unless it's some incredible game changer, or if it's a cornerback, no, you don't, you don't give up a lot of stuff to move up, I think. But with the quarterback position where the Raiders are right now, absolutely you do it. So I don't think it costs you as much as people think. And people, it's really interesting. People are, oh, we can't give up draft picks. Well, we don't know what Tom Telesco is going to do. Hopefully he's wildly successful. But what have the mm -hmm. Raiders done with draft picks? They've kept them. They've traded them you know, with mixed results. You, all of it is a crapshoot, folks. All of it is a crapshoot. So if you can do something to get up to get that quarterback, one of those top three guys, I'd say you do it. Now, to trade up for Bo Nix or something like that, maybe not, depending on what the price was. But I do think that it's worth it. And I do think that, yes, I would not go for Fields past a three. That's just me. Yeah, I agree. I'm not giving up more than a third round pick for Justin Fields. Right. That's my limit. I'm not, I'm, I've heard second or third, some GMs, around the league have said a third round pick some have said a second definitely not a first but the third round pick is my limit yeah absolutely all right so thank you guys so much for that that's the raider nation mailbag we appreciate you guys good stuff today man we had a ton of stuff to get through a longer show we appreciate that now that we're not going four days a week it's 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 actually not bad to do a longer show so we appreciate you guys being with us mo let everybody know i know you had your live yesterday let everybody know what you have coming up the remainder of the week so they can keep tabs on you if you haven't checked it out yet, check out my latest sports not piece, sports not piece on offensive coordinators. Uh, 
what's up. I'll, I'll talk about some of the guys that we discussed on today's show, why I don't like them or why I think they're a fit or why I don't think they're a fit. And after that, it's pretty much smooth sailing. Uh, just waiting for the Raiders <laughs> to 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 give me some news to to chomp on and, and write about. But it's it's been pretty quiet on the Raider front, which means there's usually something cooking. We'll see. Uh, if something does come up, it'll be up on Sports Night. There you go. I love it. Also, uh, make sure I got a lot of great feedback on my my salary cap piece. So check that out up on SportsNot. Uh, dot com as well. We'll we'll post Mo's latest piece as well as mine in the description below if you're watching us on YouTube so you guys can find it very easily. That's good. I love it. All right, Mr. Moten, you have a good weekend. We'll get back right at this next week. Sure will. Be back. All, <laughs> all right. For our producer, Mike Robbie for Mo Moten, I am Scott Colbranson. This has been Silver and Black Today. Don't forget, Please subscribe wherever you get your audio. Also, if you're watching us on one of the video channels, subscribe, hit that notifications bell, and also leave us comments. Get in the discussion there. We certainly appreciate it. You guys have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next week.